I'm a huge fan of profit first and like other accounting systems around it. And I think it's such an essential thing for real estate investors because like our business, you know, if you're aware that you work with hundreds of investors across uh, the country is such a cash flow. Basically, it's a business of the way I look at it, it's managing your cash flow. So I'm really excited to jump into it. Hey guys, welcome to our weekly mastermind call. My name is Sharad. I'm the owner and founder of Recently. I'm really excited about today's call. I used to be an accountant, so I geek out about numbers. So super excited about today's call uh, with David. He is the author of um, Profit, Profit First for Real Estate Investor. Sorry, man. I just I flew in this morning and I have a flight later today. So Running a little bit uh, low sleep, but David and I connected at Collective Genius a uh, couple of months ago, and he and I talked, and I think he would be a great guest to come on the call and just share, you know, his knowledge, his experience on, you know, some of the uh, the drawbacks that real estate investors uh, run into, and um, cool. Hey, you have a fan here, and Aaron right. said he just bought the book. Can't wait to dive in. Yeah, yeah man, amazing sure. book. Yeah, amazing book. Yeah, um, I'm a huge fan of uh, profit first and like other, you know, accounting systems around it. And I think it's such an essential thing for real estate investors because like our business, you know, you, you're aware that you work with hundreds of investors across uh, the country is such a cash flow. Basically, it's a business of the way I look at it. It's managing your cash flow. So I'm really excited to jump into it. Yeah, man, if you just want to give a little bit of intro about yourself and then we can jump right into it. So a background about myself, I'm actually from the Northwest Indiana area where Sherrod is right now and uh, have a real estate investing background, Just get read Rich Dad Poor Dad in college and that was game over. Uh, was a part of a company that Sherrod knows the people there. We were doing like 25 deals a month at our highest point back in 2000, probably 16, 17. Uh, we were doing that, but we were spending about 26 worth of deals out the door. So that doesn't really math well. You don't have to have an accounting degree to know that you're bringing in 25 and then spending 26 out the door. It just was not fun. Uh, so that's what kind of got me kickstarted here. Of like, I bet you a bunch of other people have this issue. Like we're making money, but where's it going? You know, like just living deal to deal, that type of stuff. That's where I got around other investors and just other people that I knew that were also in the same predicament, you know, on different scales. Maybe they were doing a couple deals a year, but spending more than they were making. And it's like, why did I get into this? That's what got me even interested in profit first in that message. I actually said, hey, I want to just help investors and help them like know the numbers and all that. And then a mentor of mine, Gary Harper, said you should read profit first. So he's the one that got me into the profit first system. And then from there, I was like, okay, I want this to be a part of the company because the profit first system really clarifies where your cash is going from an entrepreneur's point of view. You don't have to be an accountant or anything to, to use this system. So that's where I really dove into it. And then a year into it, you know, was implementing it with a lot of people and then reached out to Mike Michalowicz, the original author of Profit First and got the Profit First for Real Estate Investing green light to write that book. And then now just getting that message out. So that's a very high level overview of my background and where I am today, because now I am the author of that book and have a small fractional CFO company helping people in the real estate investing world implement Profit First and do stuff like that. So there you go, Sherrod, there's, there's my background. Then you want me to, I have a presentation ready if you I'm going to go right into that. Yeah, for yeah man. Profit first yeah, no, you, yeah, go ahead, man. Whatever you think. Works Let's do best. it. Yeah, go ahead if you want to share. Can you see my screen? Yep. All good here? Uh, okay, yes. Cool. Yes, sir. So profit first. So Aaron, I really appreciate you shouting me out there, you know, buying the book. Because for me, the profit first book, when I first read it, was life changing. And then with the heavy background in real estate investing, I saw that if you've never read profit first, it's all about the cash management system. We'll go over the fundamentals today. But then I saw that, hey, it's not just about managing it. We need to know from the real estate perspective, if you're doing rentals or if you're selling or wholesaling or flipping, like how do we know where the money's going? So that's what it's about. I want you to keep more money without having to close more deals or becoming a financial wizard. I do have to throw in a disclaimer because we're talking about financial stuff, which it's hilarious. Sherrod has the accounting background. I'll be very honest with you. I run a fractional CFO company. I have zero accounting background. I'm not a bookkeeper. I'm not a CPA. I'm a real estate investor who's dangerous with the numbers, but has a very good team now who are much smarter than me that has all those degrees and stuff. But now it's like, I just want to make sure that you know that this is someone that I speak the language. I know where you're coming from as a real estate investor. And that's why I have to put this on there 
because like I'm not your person. I'm not definitely not your CPA or tax attorney or I, anything like that. So yeah, I think I think I want to I think I want to say yeah. because you're not from an accounting background. I think it makes a huge difference in a positive way because then you're speaking the language of real estate investor. You're not coming in from an accountant point of view. You're just coming straight from a real estate investor point of view, which is I think great because I used exactly. to be an accountant. And, and I'm a real estate investor now. So I always yeah. have that influence of accounting. You know, when like we have an accounting software and people reach yeah. out to me, like just my default is going into debit credit, which is not useful. Uh, so I, I appreciate that uh, you share yeah. that. And I, I think it makes it incredibly useful because everything is from a real estate investor point of view. I, I appreciate that. And I've lived this. I've lived exactly what we're exactly. talking about today. Like if you feel the pain of what, I, of what I'm talking about here, like the stories that I share, like I've lived it too. So I, I understand, I understand what's going on. I'm not just poking, poking the bear here. If you th feel that, the, cause I always get people like, how did you know I'm going through this? Like, cause I've been there. So here we go. I hate fix it flipping. Joey English came to me 2019 and said these words. And I'm like, that sucks. Cause this is like your main source of income. So like, tell me what's going on. So he says to me, I, Sharon might've even been there. Like there's, this was a, this was 2019. Yeah. Like, yeah at a sharper event. event. Yeah. yeah a sharper event. And Joey came to me and said, yeah, I hate it. And so I said, talk to me. So he said, okay, it's 2019. I started to scale up. I started, instead of doing like a couple deals a month, we started trying to do three to four deals. So I went into overdrive mode. I started going to all the houses and it like just a hundred hour weeks, you know, like 80, 90, hundred hour, like it was getting crazy. His wife started working in the business. Like it was, it was getting crazy. And then at the end, of the year, he goes into his CPA's office and he says, okay, tell me, tell me how we did. Well, the CPA says, well, looking at your books, I'd never get into real estate investing. So he felt like, oh my gosh, there's all the hours wasted. But then she gave the kicker, which really like give him a kick in the teeth. She said, you lost $70,000 this year in 2019. Then he felt like a, a huge gut punch because then he had to go home and tell his wife who was starting to work in the business. She was having seizures that year because it was so stressful. Like it was a crazy situation. And he's like, David, I did more deals this year in 2019 than I've ever done. And I've lost more than I've ever lost. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like this is, I could feel his pain. You know why? Because we were doing that in our business, doing all those deals every month, but then spending more than we were making. It was like, why are we doing this? So I knew exactly where it was coming from. So when he said, now I understood when he said, I hate this, what I've created here. It's because even though he was doing a lot of deals, he wasn't feeling like this was where I should be. I feel successful. I feel like that real estate was worth it. So I'm like, okay, that to me was a lot of people's story. It was my story. So that's where the pain we feel. Most owners know we make money, but feel broke. I don't know if you've ever been there as a real estate investor. If you're wholesale, I don't care what you're doing. At some point, if we don't button down the financial side of the business, we're going to feel this way that we're making money, but where's it all going? You know, like I just closed on another deal and now I don't see any of that money in my account. You know, it was like a great deal that we just closed. So we all feel that pain. And I, we, that's something that every one of us experiences and as an entrepreneur. This is not just real estate investing industry. This is if you have any type of business. That's where a lot of people feel that. But the root problem is we think that income, more income or the next deal will solve our problem. And that's where a lot of people get off the rails because they think they're trying to attack the root problem and they're not. They're going after something just like if you have in your personal finances and you say, OK, if I just make more money, then I'll just be, you know, I'll be able to do the things I want to do. We think it's the same thing in business. Like if we just have seven figures in a year, all of our problems will go away. Or if we just close that deal and then we uh, wonder why in the world that doesn't happen and our problems get bigger. That's where if you've ever read Keith Cunningham's books, he's a great business author. He says, if you scale cancer, the tumor grows. And that's really how a lot of us work in our business. We just think that if we just get more deals in, that's going to solve everything. And then you're 10 years into it wondering what in the world happened. Or Joey doing more deals, but feeling broke and say, and going backwards. Like she, the CPA even said to him, like, you should, would have been better for you to work at McDonald's. Like if he wasn't feeling bad enough already, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's where I don't want you to feel like that. I don't want you to ever be in Joey's position. If you haven't been there, or if you are there or have ever been there, like there's a way out of it. That's where I felt the prop first system came into play. But there's three simple numbers that I want you to take away from this and a framework that if you get this down, will help you as a business owner and entrepreneur, knowing what you make, spend, and keep. Do you know how much is coming in? Do you know how much is going out? And are you keeping any of it? Like if I can give you a simple framework for that, 
with what I'm talking about today. I'm going to give you practical steps. This is not all fluff, not all stories. This is all about I want to give you the tools to be able to know where is your money going. The clarity that that brings and the clarity that that gives you to make the better decisions. And if you don't have this, if you don't know these numbers, a lot of people don't in their business. They think they do. They think that they're keeping it on a spreadsheet or that they know the average profit. And it's like, we have to know the numbers. And that's why I love Sherrod, because whenever we get together, he's all about the numbers. He's built everything in his systems around the numbers, the KPIs. That's where I want to make sure that you have a simple system on your back end to say, here's where my money's going. This is where every dollar is going. I want you to have a simple system to know what am I making, spending, and keeping. Because up until now, we've been conditioned not to be the business owner. I think we can all agree. If you went to a traditional school, you're a failure. You, you know, like if you fail, you're a failure. You know, like if you don't do this thing, like if you raise your hand and you're called on and then you give the wrong answer, you feel like a moron, never want to do it again. Like we got all these bad ticks, right, uh, growing up. Then if you had parents who said money doesn't grow on trees, no, we can't go there. No, we can't do that. No, we can't blah, 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 fill in the blank. So we've got in all this conditioning, okay? Then you go to college, great, the same thing, W-2 job. They definitely don't condition you to be a business owner. Then you get the money and you're like, okay, do I want to trade my freedom for the money? And then you jump into real estate and you're like, where's the freedom? But that's where you, we've been conditioned not to be the business owner. Then you jump into real estate and you're like, yes. This is where it's going to be. I'm going to have the freedom I've always wanted. This is it. Then other owners are conditioning you because it's the blind leading the blind at that point where a lot of people don't have the background like you're out of like they know the numbers. They've got the accounting degree. It's like a lot of us just jump into it to say, I can do the deal. I know what the deal, you know, as long as I get the deals in, everything will be all right. And then that's how we salve ourselves that it's going to be okay and this is the formula that they give us we love our formulas right as real estate investors we say it's sales minus expenses equals profit meaning i make a sale i pay everyone else and their mother and hopefully at the end of the day i have something left over if we just do enough in sales we can pay everything and then there will be enough and then that day never comes this is some event that's always in the future that is never coming to fruition so what happens from there? You spend money to make money. You reinvest everything back to the business, which is just code for like, I have no idea where my money's going. Then you build your business on the hope and pray plan. You're hoping you make enough. Pray that you have some left over at the end of the year. That's how most people run their business. Even if they're doing a bunch of deals, that's how Joey was. He was just hoping that the deals were going to cover everything that he was pouring into his business in 2019. Then at the end of the year, guess what? He, made, he did more deals and lost more than ever. That's what happens. What really happens is you become an accidental nonprofit. He loves giving. Joey's a big giver. And he wants to give to the charities and organizations. But at that year, he was like his own nonprofit. I don't want you to become an accidental nonprofit just because we don't have a good system for the cash in our business. So that's what really happens. If you've never played this game, it's a great game. Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow 101. But you know if you've played it, you play literally in that circle for probably 90% of the game, trying to get out of the rat race because you're trying to get your passive income to exceed your expenses. But we think as a real estate investor, when we jump into real estate, that we've jumped out of that circle and straight onto the fun track because like real estate was supposed to give us our freedom, right? That financial freedom, cover all of our dreams. Then with our current habits around money, because we didn't realize we're not really paying, playing the real estate game, we're playing the money game. And we're failing at the money game. So that just keeps us in that little circle going around and around. And we thought, oh, man, I thought I was going to be on the fun track, that outer track where it's a lot of fun. And that's where we're trapped. Now, instead of paycheck to paycheck, we're living deal to deal, month to month. I don't want you there. If the, your current habits are putting you there or those current beliefs or like the conditioning that we've had, there's a better way to get out of this. I don't want you there. And that's where more is not always better. Better is better. I don't want you spinning your wheels thinking, I just have to, if I just do one more deal, that's going to be it. I land on that little green space, get another house, all my troubles will be over. And then it's just off to the races again. I want you to become better, better with your money, better with knowing where it's going, better at knowing what you make, spend and keep making sure you have a simple system to track the money and to make sure you know where it's going and you can keep more of it. Keeping more equals the freedom that you want. That's what it boils down to. So that's where I want to give you the wealth formula. I'm going to show you the crappy formula that we're pretty much spoon fed by everyone else who doesn't have a system like this, then here's the formula that can help change it and become better. The wealth formula, sales minus profit 
equals expenses, meaning I make a sale. I take my profit off the table, take my profit first. There's the whole profit first mentality. Then the expenses are what's left over to grow the business. You still need that. You need still need to grow the business. Still need sales too. You still need to be closing deals. But this is being intentional with the dollars and making sure that every dollar has a name and that the first dollars go to profit. So how do we do this? Because this is also something we've heard before. If you've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he says in Rich Dad, Poor Dad a billion times, pay yourself first. You know, like he just beats that in with all of his different books. Richest man in Babylon, portion of all I have is mine to keep. The seven habits of highly effective people. And it's like place first things first. Different books like that have put this mentality into us, but they haven't given us a system. And as a real estate investor, an entrepreneur, this is why Profit First resonated with me at the beginning. Was that not only are they giving me the formula, there's also steps to take that I can take, you know, like practical back end things that I could do with my money. That's a system. That's repeatable. That from every deal going forward, you can be profitable. That's what I want for you today. And that's why I want to give you three steps to become the wealthy owner and avoid financial ruin. The number one reason companies go out of business is they run out of money and there's no more money to be lent to them. So that's where I want you to make sure that you don't get to that position and that you can actually get from what you want from the business. So if you're if you're going to be in this community where I'm sure Sherrod talks about the numbers, talks about the different things, talks about bringing in the deals or has people come on to say, here's how you can generate more deals or whatever, or this is how you can get your contract conversion rate show better, like all those things. If you're going to spend your hard earned time and dollars in the real estate world, I don't want it all going out the back door. And you just saying, okay, I'm a year into this. What the heck happened? Or I'm five years into this. Like, where's all the money going? Or Joey, he was several years into real estate in 2019. And like, this was not worth it. You know, so that's where I want to give you these practical steps. So number one, find what you need to keep. I want you to find what you need. Why, why do I say this? Because one of the biggest mistakes people make on the financial side of their business is they build their business on the hope and pray plan. What I was talking about. I hope I make enough. I pray there's some left over versus knowing, knowing what you need from the business. Let me tell you a quick story around that. Crucial Conversations is a great book. Pick it up if you're a reader. In chapter 10, it's called Retaking Your Pen. It's a metaphor for your pen is like your self-worth. So when you're born, you're born with your pen in your hand. You're writing your story. It's a very easy to write it when you're a kid. You don't care what people think, what you're wearing. My daughter left this morning with red pants on and a red shirt. You know, like she was just all in, like she doesn't care. She's six years old. She's got her pen in her hand writing her story. Nothing's deterring her. But then you get a little bit older, junior high, high school, you care. What are they wearing? How are they acting? How do I fit in? How am I accepted? Well, you're giving them your pen and they're writing your story. Then you wonder why as a teenager, you feel crappy and like, what the heck is happening? And like, but as a teenager, we don't, if, unless we have good role models, someone, no one's telling us that that's happening. They're writing our story. And then we're all out of sorts. Then if you're on this call though, you probably at some point took back your pen and said, you know what? I don't care what the world thinks. I don't care what anyone else thinks out there. I am going to start this real estate company. I'm going to wholesale deals or I'm going to flip or I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to go out there and create something, make an impact on people. I'm going to write my story. And then you took back your pen and it feels good, right? feels good to do that first deal. You see that check and it's like, wow, this is not just something fake people post online. Like I actually got money into my bank account from this deal that I closed and it feels good. But then you get around a group of people or you hear someone like, me say, oh, we did 25 deals, which sounds amazing. But now when you're spending 26 out the door and they don't tell you that at the masterminds, at the events and stuff like that, of like, they'll say the gross, but not a lot of people talk about the net because they're embarrassed. Either number one, they don't know it. Or number two, that sucks. There is no net. They're an accidental nonprofit. But then you listen to someone like that or the gurus out there in Facebook land and they're saying, do all these deals. Then you get caught up like Joey did. And then you're saying, ooh, I should be doing more deals. I should be going bigger. I should be hiring more people. I should be doing this stuff. You get a case of the shoulds there. And then you give up your pen again. So you, even though you took it back to start your business, now you gave it up in a different form and fashion to be able to someone else. And now you're, you're trying to write their story. But they're really writing yours. And they're saying you should be doing this much. And then you're trying to do three to four deals like Joey in a month or like 20 or 25. And then from there, you say, I hate my business. I hate fix and flipping like Joey did. I want you to know what you need from your business because that's the greatest form of taking back your pen and making sure that the things that you are actually uh, trying to attain are for you and for your family. 
and making sure that you have your pen grasp firmly and are not just trying to compare yourself to someone. Otherwise, you're going to be in your rat race your entire life, never really seeking, never really attaining what you're trying to go after and what you're seeking out there. So take back your pen. You did it to start the business. You might as well do it again. Take it back and say, I know what I need from my business. So what do I really mean? I'm going to talk about this as owner's compensation, owner's comp, this concept that you need to pay yourself what you need on a monthly basis and that your business needs to provide that for you. And you need to know that number. And what is that number for you and your family? Because pre-profit first, you're either doing one of two things. You're either starving yourself or starving your business. You're either saying, I'm not, I had a call with a guy this morning where he said, he point blank told me on this call, I have a scarcity mindset. Like I'm scared to spend the money because I want to make sure that the, my people are paid, that are that the marketing goes out and like all this stuff. And he had zero clarity of where his money was going. So he was starving himself. He's like, I'm not really paying myself what I need. You know, he's like, I'm just trying to make sure that everything is taken care of. But he has no idea if he can take more out or not. Like he has no clarity. So a lot of people are there. I did a podcast with a client and he said like, hey, I used to stand up in front of my employees and say, I'm not taking a paycheck for you. And that was supposed to be motivational to them. And he's and his mindset has completely shifted from that. But that's where like the employees literally were during those meetings, looking at their phone, looking down and like on Indeed, like, is this company going down? You know, it's like that's where a lot of people are there in the starving themselves situation. Like they are they're scared to spend the money. The other one, starving your business. That's the one that might not happen as much. That's where it's like your first $50,000 check comes in and boom, I'm getting that Lamborghini. It's like, wait a second there. You just closed one deal. Like what's going on? So it's like, don't do either extreme. I want you to take what you need without hurting the business or hurting yourself. So that's what this is about, making sure you know what you need and then aggressively attacking that number. So how do you actually know what it is? Number one, find your keep number at the end. I'll give you a form. It's a simple six question form. Like of here's how you know what you're keeping. I could do a whole section on that. I've recorded a video too of a walkthrough of like, here's how you find what you need to keep and start taking back your pen. So you know what you need. Then you build your business plan around the keep number. So it's not the hope and pray plan anymore. It's what do we need to keep from our business that will make sure that we get what we really want instead of what other people are telling us we should do. But then talk about it with a business partner or spouse. So if you've got someone who's close to you that the money affects, so if you have a business partner in your business, you probably have two different keep numbers. You need to talk about that. What does each person need at that level of the business where you are right now? Your spouse also, if you have a spouse, talk with them. Where do you, I don't want them asking you uh, over and over again. It's probably getting annoying. Like, when can we go out to dinner? When can we get, buy groceries? When can we do this and that? It's like, let's get a plan in place so you can be very conscientious of like what's happening on the home front and what you can take from the business as well, too. So this is the first point. This first one is more just you taking back your pen, making sure that you as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, know what you need and then go after that number and make that your first real goal, no matter where you are right now. A lot of people have these big nebulous goals. Oh, I want to hit seven figures. Why? Give me a good reason. Is there, is there something that will keep you fighting if you don't hit seven figures or does this sound cool? versus no i need seven figures because of this for my family this for that i want to give or this that i want to do and travel or whatever like if you could give me that that's a lot better than just pulling something out of your butt so like what do you need from your business that's the first thing to get you on track so that way it gives you your first goals that's where with joey we sat down i sat down with him and said okay here you go the concept what do you need to keep he went home with his wife filled out the form and said okay david i came back but i went a step further i said this is what I need to keep. He told me the number. Then he's like, this is how many deals I need to do. He's like, guess. And I said, I don't know, back to one to two deals a month. He's like, no, five. I need to do five flips in 2020 and I will be able to cover what I need for payroll for the fix and flip company and I won't need to steal from my rentals. Like take the cash flow from there to fund the fix and flip company. And I'm like, that's powerful. And he said, yeah, it's very clarifying to know what I need from these flips in order to, to float this company without having to hurt the other stuff that I have going on. So that's where just having that clarity for him was a big mental, just a mental lift off his shoulders, like making sure that you know where every dollar needs to go for you and for making sure that you know what you need from your company. So there you go. That's number one. Number two, simply is create your wealth system. How to know what you make, spend and keep. This is the point here. Where I'm going to give you some practical steps, what you can literally set up from here 
that will help you. I've been on enough calls. I've been doing this long enough now where I've come back and spoke to different groups like this, where I've spoke like to them a year ago, they've gone and actually implemented some of this. And, so, and people are telling me like, this either saved my business from going out of business or like I have more cash now than I've ever had. Like I want you to have that same type of story. So this is how to create that type of system in your business. I don't care if you're doing zero deals and you're on your first or if you're doing a thousand deals a year, this is where now you can get a grasp around where the money is going. So if you have one big bank account, this is probably another big, this is one of the other biggest mistakes I see a lot of entrepreneurs make in general. You have one big bank account, all the money goes in, all the money goes out, and you have no clarity. It's just the money's there. If there's money there, I'll spend it. If there's not money there, I need to be a bit more frugal today. It's not, hey, you don't know what's yours, what's payroll, what's marketing, where there's no clarity whatsoever. No clear decisions can be made. Then you feel guilty if you ever do take money out. I ran into this today as well, too. I had on a call with another lady, and she's like, I am scared to take money out of my business because I don't know if that's going to hurt the rest of the business as well, too. A lot of people feel guilty when, because, but they don't know. They have just one big bank account. Where's all this money going? Is it mine? Is it profit? Is it tax time? And I have to pay taxes? Like, so a lot of the things to plan for as a real estate investor business owner. So that's where I want to attack this one because this one's an easy one to overcome. I want you to set up the modernized envelope system in your business. If you know the envelope system, that's where you put different envelopes for different expenses in your personal life. So you know when that money's gone, can't spend any more on that expense. Same thing here. I don't want, if you, if the word budget scares you, this should help you a lot because this is way better than a budget. This is helping you know where the dollars are going and giving you a system for that without it becoming this huge monster and nightmare. So I want you to do the modernized envelope system because as a business owner, you don't need to be stuffing envelopes. You need to be leveraging what you're already doing. I guarantee almost 99% of the people on here have a phone that has banking apps on it and you check it on a daily or at least a weekly basis versus unless you're Sherrod and have a background in accounting, checking a QuickBooks software or something like that or, or, or re-simply you know, on a daily or weekly basis of where your money is going. That's where I want to leverage what you're already doing. This is what spoke to me as the entrepreneur. So what spoke to Joe, like actually having bank accounts, because I'm going to look at them anyway, I might as well know what the dollars are assigned for, where I'm going to be spending them and what I want to use them for. I'm sending my soldiers to battle versus just going out there haphazardly, just shooting in the dark. So here we go. The golden trio of accounts. This is the first three I want you to set up. And I get it. I get my ammo. I look like the numbers guy and I look like I would like Harry Potter and Star Wars. But here we, I love these three, I love this epic sagas because they have three main heroes, right? The ones that you get attached to. Harry, Ron, Hermione, Luke, Han, Leia. Your business is your epic saga, okay? It doesn't get any bigger than your life, than what you're going to pass on, your business, the things that you are building right now is either going to be sold off one day Pass down to the next generation or something. I don't want you to go out of business or ruin everything because you don't have a simple system. So that's where the golden trio are there to make sure you win in the end, that the emperor is defeated or that Voldemort is taken down, like making sure that at the end of your career, your tenure as a real estate investor, that you, in your mind, you've won whatever that means to you, the financial freedom you want today. That's where I want you to have a golden trio. So what is that golden trio? These three accounts help you keep more of the money because this is where most people struggle with is actually feeling like the business owner. And am I, is it worth it? This is where Joey's struggle was. The first three accounts, profit, owner's comp, and owner's tax. Profit and owner's comp, I get the question all the time, what's the difference between these accounts? Profit, the difference is frequency of when you take it out and what the money is earmarked for. Profit is taking out quarterly up to 50% of what's in that account to use for whatever you want. Pay down debt on your portfolio, Go out there and spend money on a boat. I don't care. The profit is why you started your business and helping you fund that dream. The owner's cop account is what we talked about from number one. It is my favorite account because it is the one that the light bulb turns on the most when we work with people. Owner's cop is where how much do you need to pay yourself consistently to make sure you're not in your own rat race in the business? So that way it's like, okay, how much do we need to keep? Then the owner's comp is how often can I fill that number up enough on a monthly basis to take that from the business? And if you're like, well, I'm starting, I'm just getting off the ground. Well, then good. Then you have a goal to get to of I need to be able to fund this account and see that. So that's where it's like, or if you're down the road and like, I'm not paying myself enough, what do you need to pay yourself and how much can you put towards owner's comp right now? 
then owners tax that's also the frequency for owners comp is like weekly bi-weekly monthly like that's more frequent owners comp than the profit profit's more like icing on the cake owners comp is getting you out of your rat race Owner's tax is like, if you're going to owe taxes at the end of the year, you don't have a bunch of rentals, you're not doing cost segregation, you're not doing the depreciation game, and you can't go down to zero every year, you need a tax bucket, a tax count. So that way, at tax time, you're not running around like a chicken with your head cut off. What, it's April right now, so most people won't be due to September, October-ish there because you'll file an extension, because I know all y'all. So that's where, even if you are filing the extensions and such, you need to make sure you have taxes at tax time if you're going to owe. So don't be, don't have that be another financial strain when it doesn't need to be, when it's something we can plan for and be intentional about. There's your golden trio to help you keep more of the money. There are other foundational accounts because it's not just all about keeping it. It's about growing the business and making sure you know what you're bringing in. And it's the third account there that number six is keeping you out of a Ponzi scheme. But I'll talk about that in a second. Income is separate from OPEX. OPEX, everyone has. It's the bad guy of the business. It's the Voldemort or whatever. It's the one that's the outflow of money goes from. It's the one that's constantly going out. Income is separate from OPEX where now you probably have your money coming in and out of the same account right now. I would set up an income account as like a deposit account where all deposits come into that income account and sit there until you transfer them to first the Golden Trio and then to OPEX. So making sure you're funding your keep accounts and then funding your spend account, that OPEX account, so you know. Do I have enough to keep the business going and fund what I want from the business, what I want to keep? OPM is specifically for the real estate investing world, other people's money. And if you're, well, for the real estate investing world and anyone who borrows money, because if you borrow the money and you're getting the draws directly paid to you, or you get the lump sum at closing when you purchase the property, instead of lumping that all in with all of your other money and feeling really good that you have a big bank balance and giving yourself that false sense of security, Put it in a separate account so that way when you do rehab projects and things like that, you're not touching your OPEX money or you're not touching their money for your OPEX, like the OPM and the other people's money. Because now you have a very clear view of, I have this many projects, I have 10 projects going on, they all need, you know, and I need, you know, 500,000 to complete all of them. Do I have 500,000 in the OPM? So it's very clear to see, do I have enough to finish all the projects that I still have going on? It's just giving you that clarity plus to know hey, I'm not touching that money. This is for the projects that we have going on because it's very easy for, you know, project A, the money's gone. Then you go to lender B on project B and then he starts funding project A, but he doesn't know about it. And then it's like, oh, great, we're in a Ponzi scheme because now other lenders are funding the previous deals. Don't get to that position. That's a horrible position to be in. If you've been there, I don't want you there. If you are there now, there's a way out. Set up this system, get yourself back on track. The profit first system is the greatest system if you're not profitable to become profitable to to help you know how unprofitable are we now versus where I want to be. Because I get that question a lot too. Should I set this up if I'm not profitable? That's why you should. Is because now, if you aren't profitable, we need to get on the track of the habits of people that have profitable businesses. There's the six accounts that I would set up. And if you're like, oh man, that's a lot of accounts. First of all, there's a bank that's Profit First Center that I'll give you at the end as well too. That helps set this up very easily online. But then also as well, like I want to make sure that you at least have a simple system. Just go out and set up one account, name it profit, transfer 1%. It's more about the habit of profitability than it is necessarily the bank accounts or anything. I'm trying for you to get to live in why you started your business. And that's where a lot of people fail on the financial side because they just don't know what to do. This is to give you a clear overview of where all your money is. Then from here, the biggest question I get is how much percentage should I put in the different accounts? Here's targets. TAP stands for target allocation percentages. Depending on the size of your business, which is this first row here, zero to 250, all the way up to 10 to 50 million, like these are the suggested percentages. If you're going, the end goal is to sell the property, these are the suggested targets for the different size of businesses. Down here is the rental company. So if you're, if you're buying, hold, seller finance, whatever, these are the percentages to shoot for as buy and hold investor. These are not set in stone. These are more like what are the healthy businesses doing at these levels and how much is going to profit paying themselves. Like here you can see owners pays a lot more at the beginning because you probably don't have a lot of employees when you're starting out. But when you get bigger, that owner's pay percentage goes down, but you're making more. And then you have to pay the team, but you're still getting paid what you're worth. It's just now a smaller percentage of a bigger pie. But this just gives you a good target. So if you're like, I'm nowhere near that. When we start like analyzing this with people, so many people are like, 
very, they're way out of whack. Usually their operating expenses are like 80, 90%, and they're probably paying themselves 10% or less, but they just don't know. They don't know where they're spending it. Doesn't They don't know where the money's going out the door. This is a target where if you are that upside down, it's giving you, okay, over the next quarter, how much can we go from 90% OPEX down to, you know, can I go down to 90, 85, 80, you know, just start to slowly scale down the expenses while increasing what you're keeping. So that's the taps. Everyone's getting this sheet too. So if you're trying to take a picture, saw some people doing that. It's like, you also get this at the end. And so with Joey, I'm a very visual person as an entrepreneur. At the beginning, he was like, I'm not setting up all those accounts. I'm like, you're setting up all those accounts or do you want to be in the exact same place where you were a year ago? So then he set up all the accounts and then he sends me a screenshot every year. He's like, Dude, I would never go back to one account. Look at this. I know how much is coming in, how much is going out, how much is for my taxes, for my profit, income from the other business, my OPM rehab, my, my, what can I pay myself? Like it's all there in black and white. Like I at least know the dollars that I have designated for the different areas of my business. Then on the left-hand side on the top, he sent me this picture in 2020. This was the first vacation he took from his profit account that he didn't have to worry about. Was it touching any of his other accounts or could he take this and feel bad about it? like that? Was a guilt-free vacation. That was why he started the business was to spend time with the family and he was able to do that. A simple three-day weekend. If you've read Profit First, the original, Mike McCowitz talks about his first profit draw was like $10. So he bought an ice cream cone and said it was the best tasting ice cream cone ever because it was his money and he didn't have to worry about that he was robbing from other accounts or from other things inside of his business, from his payroll or marketing. That's where I want you to get to that point. You have a profit account and it's serving you. And on the bottom, this is what's great. He, to bring the story full circle with his CPA, he walks in the, the, in the last three years to her office and says, okay, how are my books looking now? First year and every other year, she said, what in the world happened? Like looking at your books, I would get into real estate. And like, you're actually profitable. You're even with your rentals, with your other stuff, stuff that you're doing and the sales that you have from, you know, your wholesale and fix and flip, you have enough profit that you're owed taxes. So he's like, tell me the number. The first year she told him the number and he's like, let me look at my phone. He pulls up the little you know, bank accounts like that. And he has almost down to like, he's a hundred dollars within the range. Like he has a hundred dollars extra. He's like, where do I send the money? She's like, what? You know, and she has to pick herself off the floor this time. And she said, okay, like send it here. He's like, good. I don't want to talk to you for another year. So then he goes back the next two years. She tells him the number. It's the same story. But then the next two years, he has over 10,000 extra that he saved because he was able to take more depreciation or bought more rentals. Like just from the his estimates, he was overestimating. And that's where he was able to the first year buy an RV with the extra profits. And then the second year for the extra from the tax account, he gave to a camp for kids, which we'll talk about at the end of number three and what he did there. But that's where I want you, instead of worrying at tax time, potentially giving yourself a tax refund. Like I've done that. A lot of our clients do this. Like we even did this this year. We overestimated. So that way I'd rather have more money in my account than less than like be at there at like, oh shoot, I got to do two more deals just to get this done. That's where the power of the system, knowing where the dollars are going. He told me, David, I did less deals I, in 2020 than I did in 2019. And this is the least I think I've done because in 2020, he did five deals. He did the, what he was projecting. And he said, I have more money in my account than I've ever had before. And I'm like, boom, that is the power of the system. That is what I want for each person on this call here is like just to see the power of the clarity. If you have clarity around the numbers, what it gives you. That's why ReSimply is such an awesome platform too, because it gives you a lot of that clarity for a lot of the different KPIs in your business. But I want you to have that as well on the back end with your cash and the money because a P&L is 100% different than the cash in your bank account. So I want you to have a simple system that makes sense for you as the entrepreneur. What's the final point here to combat to all that? Build wealth habits. I don't want you to go out of business. I want you to be building the wealth habits that no matter what happens in the marketplace, you're secure. I don't care if it's another 2008 or nine, or if it's a COVID or whatever it is, a, another giant scare like that, unless America goes down, then this is, I want you to be secure in where your money's going. So I want you to build wealth habits and keep more of what you're actually making. So how do we do that? I want you to build some actual things, routines and rhythms into your business. So that way I'm talking a lot about the money here. And like sure, I took a big gamble because usually when financial people come on, it's probably not as fun to talk about. It's like the marketing and the sales and that type of stuff. But what I want here is you to have consistent habits that you do in your business so that you're building these into those routines. So that way you don't have to think about the money. 
even though we've been talking about it a lot, I don't want you to have to think about it all the time. Like it might be consuming your thoughts now. So every week, move the money. Every week, get into the rhythm of it comes into the income account. And then I transfer it first to the golden trio and then to the OPEX account. So making sure you get into that rhythm and you say, well, I don't close a property a week. Well, then what do I do every week by Friday? Make sure the money goes from income to the other accounts. So if you say like Joey, Joey is a great example. Did five deals that first year. That So that first year we did about one transfer a quarter. But when you sold a property by the Friday of that week, no matter when it fell, we were moving the money. So that way it wasn't just sitting. That way you don't have to think about the money as much. You're in a routine, a rhythm. Money closes by Friday. I'm going to transfer it from income to these other accounts. Then every month, review it. This is something that a lot of people don't like to do is review the money because they don't know how to do it or it's too complicated. They're not the financial wizard or the guru on the back end, the accountant. But if you follow this system and you set up the income account, you saw I put the little parentheses make next to it. So you know what is coming in. How much are you making? The OPEX, what are you spending? What's going out of that account? If that account now just has every single outflow of the business, it helps you know what you're spending. Then the keep accounts. How much did you transfer from income to the keep accounts? So that way you can clearly see on a monthly basis what came in, what went out, what did I keep? You can at least have that clarity, which gives you a lot better decision-making process than how much is in my one big bank account today and can I spend the money? You know, And if I do this, is it going to hurt me or not? This gives you more clarity to direct those dollars and then every month review it to know how much came in, how much went out. Are we at least above break even and then growing or was I able to keep enough? Do I want to keep more? What's happening in the business at this point? Then every quarter, take the money. This is it. This is the whole reason of this presentation. You got into real estate to break out of the mold and to become the entrepreneur and to have financial freedom. For the love of God, every quarter, use an account to attain that freedom. Whatever that means to you, I don't care if that's taking trips, if that's going on vacation with your family, if that's going you know, to different mastermind events and syncing up with real estate investors, if that's whatever it is for you, every quarter, take the money up to 50% from profit and use it for what you want. Celebrate your success. This is how, for Joey, it went from being a drudgery to like, and saying, I hate the business to I'm excited about it. I not only am I paying myself, but I get to invest in things like an RV or in a camp for kids or something like that. So take the money up to 50% and use it for what you want. The only other reason to use the profit account is if you have really bad debt, credit card debt that's keeping you up at nine, unsecured loans that you had to get to keep your company afloat, whatever it might be. Use the profit account up to 90% to start wiping that down. Give yourself a debt pay down plan like that and just say any extra dollars are going towards that so I don't have to worry about it anymore. But this profit account is really why you started your business. That's the big thing for you is making sure every quarter, no matter what it is, paying down properties in your portfolio, there's a million reasons why you get into real estate for financial freedom, to for whatever it might be. But this is where every quarter, take the money and use it for what you want. So recap, find what you need to keep, take back your pen. Okay, you did it at one point. You said, I believe in myself enough to start the business. Do it again to say, I want to stay in business and I want to be insanely profitable. Number two, create the wealth system. So that way you can keep more and then build a wealth habit so you can use the profits for what you want and to go out there and attain that financial freedom and then build it as a habit into your system versus an event that you're trying to get to one day in the future. So that's why with Joey, he sent me this picture on the right hand side. I'm like, you want me to show that? I'm like, he said, yeah. He's like, 2019, that was me in the big orange shirt. And like, I, I couldn't work out. I couldn't do anything. I was just trying to go, 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 do more, more, more versus the things that really benefited my life. So instead of working out, doing the stuff that he wanted to do, then, I mean, he took it to the extreme. He did like four triathlons last year. I'm like, okay, man, like that's a thing. Good, good for you. <laughs> but that's where it gives you the other benefits as a real estate investor. But this, these next two slides are my favorite of the whole ones because profit unlocks your purpose. The purpose of the business is to be profitable. That's where I'm just trying to give you the system that helps the business be profitable because you know why? Your purpose is not just to be profitable. It's for why were you put on this earth? You know, like your purpose, unless a lot of people say, well, it's to make a lot of money, but why? Why do you want to make a lot of money? What are you trying to do here? For Joey, it was spending more time with his family. Last year, he called me in June and said, David, I have filled up all my profit first accounts for now to the rest of the year. So he used the money from the previous year, the tax account to buy the RV. And in June or August of last year, took a three week road trip with his family, with his four little kiddos there. God bless him, but it's like, that's what he wanted to do. 
So he spent three weeks not in his business, not doing that stuff. The money was still there. He knew where it was and was able to take that time without any guilt or any worry. He's texted me later on and said, that was the best vacation I've ever taken. You know why? Because I didn't have to worry about the money. He's like, yeah, my kids were a pill and doing this stuff like normal on a vacation and a trip. But like, I didn't have to worry about the other stuff that I normally have to worry about. This is my favorite slide though, is that if you remember in 2019, he lost 70,000. Well, last year, at the end of the year, he told me, I want to give 56,000 to this camp for kids. And then he said, in the last quarter of the year, like, I think we can bump that up to 71,000. So he sent me the picture at the end of the year. I just wrote a check for over $71,000 to this camp for kids. And I was like, I was like, Joey, do you understand that number? He's like, yep. He's like, I lost $70,000 in 2019. And this year I was able to give from one account to charity to this camp for kids without touching profit, without touching owner's comp, without touching the expenses for the business to grow it. Like he didn't touch anything else, but just gave $70,000 from this one account to this camp for kids. That's his purpose was to spend time with his family and fund these different things for, you know, for his church, his community, and this camp. So those are, that's the real thing I'm trying to get across here is that you, I don't want you to just have this profitable business. I want that to be the domino that unlocks. Why did you even start it? To be able to think about the, what you were here for, to be able to do things like this. It might not be charity for you. It might literally be travel or doing those things that a lot of people just dream about. I don't want it to be a dream for you anymore. I want you to have a practical system that guides you there. So that's where I want you to go. And that's where I want you to be able to unlock your purpose. That's why with if Sherrod would just let me take two seconds with what we do, I don't want to push our company and like be very salesy at all because not everyone fits the mold. You need a good real estate investing bookkeeper. You need a good real estate investing CPA. We're not those things. We go in between. We're a CFO in the middle. We are a fractional part-time CFO because we make sure that you have the proper system implemented and all that and making sure that you have like your systems processes, the financial side taken care of so you don't have to worry about it. And then we implement a dashboard at the end that just manages the cash. Because I know Re Simply has a great dashboard for everything on the business side. I want you to make sure you have a good one for your cash as well, too. So that's what we do. But then at the end here, I want you to have a couple of key takeaways, if you're okay with this, Rod, of number one, a key, find your keep number form. So that way you know, this is what I need from my business. And then I want you to have the full profit first for real estate investing book. So Aaron, thank you for buying. You probably bought either the Audible version because you're, all of us listen to audios as real estate investors. So you bought the paper version. I want you to have the ebook too. So this is the full ebook. So that way you can highlight it, take notes, copy it from the, you know, the PDF to a Google doc or whatever and start to outline it. So I want to give you the full copy and then you could schedule a call with our team. If we're not a good fit, I will make sure you get connected to a good real estate investing bookkeeper or CPA in our space. So you can at least have some clarity on that side. That's what I'm trying to get across here. That's what I want for you is to have that clarity. We're also getting as well to cash flow multiplier, which is a simple spreadsheet of like, okay, money comes in. Where do we put it inside of the different buckets and how much? The tap sheet. So if that interested you of like the targets and how big am I, you know, like which column do I fit in and what should be my percentages? Relay, which is actually the bank where that Profit First is partnering with. If you want to set that up, it's very simple to set up online. It's Profit First. If you're like, what accounts or can I do this with my own bank? I'd seriously look into them. They're a great online solution. Uh, and they're also profit, you know, profit first centered. Then profit first for personal is another thing I created because so many people were like, hey, I'm keeping more of my business, but how do I do this in my personal life so I'm just not spending every dollar out the door that comes in as income to our home life? That's just a very simple spreadsheet with a very simple video of walking through of like, how do I implement this on the home front as well too? Because I hate budgeting or I hate all these different systems and stuff or I'm not a Dave Ramsey fan or whatever it is on your personal life then you can at least have profit first for personal as well too. That's where you can go. And then simplecfo.com, free simply. So that way you can at least have that stuff. If nothing else, you go out and set up one account from this. I will have, I feel like I have succeeded here because then you can actually go out there and get some of these habits. So that way you're not spending everything you're making. You're actually building this into your system, into your company and making profit a habit. That's why I put it at the top. Make it a habit, not an event. Make it a habit that is from every single deal that you do. Thank you so much. I'm sure I see the chat with, I don't know if there's some questions in there, but I'd love to take any questions that people have at this time, Ashrod, if you want to do that, but this is your show. So I'm going to let you take over. I'll stop yeah, sharing so, now. Yeah, thank you so much, man.
Yeah, I, yeah. I want to say like, uh, thank you for the presentation. And it's honestly in all uh, being very honest, like this is like really the first year filing my 2022 tax return in 2023 that I feel confident, you know, that I have, you know, I, I read the book, but it, it, you know, I mean, I, I'm okay with managing my cash flow, but it's like last year I like really committed to profit first. And this year I'm like, man, I'm ready to file my tax return. I don't even need an extension. I'm just, I just want to get it over with. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was because of profit first. So, uh, and, and, you know, to some extent, like you're the one who kind of validated profit first for real estate investors, you know, like previously, I don't know, my mindset was kind of used to be like, yeah, it's, you know, it's not really for real estate investors. It's more for other businesses. And then you always think my business is a little bit different from all the other right. businesses yeah. in the world. So thank you for that. Uh, Mitch, yeah, I know sure. you had a question if you want to unmute. Absolutely. Um, First of all, I, I saw you on another call. I don't know if it was with Ari Simply or another mastermind. I can't remember, but it was probably three or four months ago. And I immediately implemented some things. Um, I had already oh. read Profit First, understood the concept, but I just never took the time to set up different accounts. So thank you already. I do have a couple of quick questions. I'm sitting there looking at it now. I'm, I'm an escort, so I have to pay myself a salary. Uh, that's kind of your keep number, I guess you were calling. So I have yep. uh, my owner's comp account and it automatically drafts from my op expense account directly into, um, into that account. And so first question is, they're all regarding industry standards. For an industry standard, um, I just pay myself, I think, 40000 or 42000 a year. Is that acceptable? Like I'm, I really have, I just kind of shot in the dark with it, honestly. So that's the first question. The next question would be in regards to the tax account. I have the profit account figured out. I've talked to some coaches uh, right now. I'm putting aside 20% of every deal because uh, I'm trying to scale. And the tax account's the one that I'm really curious on. And I, yeah. I just randomly throw money into it. I have really have no idea what to expect for taxes or how much to throw in there. So those are my those are my two questions about the industry standard for um, owner salary and then taxes. What's what's some good standards to go by? So I'm going to fall back on my disclaimer that I'm not your CPA for these questions, and I have zero background as a CPA accountant bookkeeper. I just run a great business that has those people with those the credentials behind them, and that's where for the first question you really need to talk to your CPA. Is that enough? I would think that's enough for this industry. And like, it depends on the volume that you're doing too, relative to what you're bringing in. It's like, there's several factors there. That's more of like, talk to your CPA for the first one. But I think my, mm -hmm. my initial gut is like, that's probably okay. But like I said, that one's huge disclaimer there. That's more of a tax question for, for your person, the tax account. Now, here we go. I get this question a lot. I have a question for you. What are you doing? Are you real? Are you flipping wholesale? Have any rentals? Tell me just briefly overview. Primary wholesale. Um, I do have a few rentals, but that's in a, a separate company. So I have a separate bank account for my yeah. rentals and stuff. So it really just, this one's wholesaling and a, some flips. Do your companies all flow to your tax return to your personal one? Yes. Okay. So that's another question too. Cause it's like, okay, with those rentals and with everything else going on, can we offset some of the income that's coming in from the other, you know, from the wholesaling entity? So that's one thing to where to question about, but you just went in, you said you listened to me a few months ago and then set these accounts up. Number one, it's going to be data that drives your decisions going forward. 20% is a great place to start. You'll probably be overfunding the tax account at this point, unless you just do over seven figures in wholesaling, 20% is probably going to be more than enough. Because when we do 20%, it's like off real revenue. So like just the assignment fee portion, 20% of that, boom. But then you've still got some rentals and things. And like a lot of people like Joey. Good example is Joey. He was doing fix and flip and had rentals. He was doing about 15% of what we were helping him save for at the beginning. And he had some rentals as well too. And 15% was too much. So like we say 15% is a good starting point because that's like off your, you know, the real revenue or your gross profit or whatever. So that way after that, you still get to expense everything else from all the other line items. And then is 15 enough. That's where too, like for some of the businesses we work with, 15% is too much if it's a rental company or it's, you know, or they're, or they come to us and they're spending a lot of money. They're already in the hole. Like they're spending 90, 95% of what they're making. Well, there's, you're not going to be taxed on much if your PL doesn't show much of a profit. So that's the other thing too, is like, what is your, what are your books showing too, as far as your profit margin and your profitability? 
just some of those things to look out for. But the best is going to be when you get your first tax return done after imp implementing profit first and seeing how much you overshot or undershot. That's where it's like you can do some guesstimates with your tax preparer too of like, what do you think my quarterly payment should be as a business owner? Like you can set some of that up. And then at the end, did you have enough during the year for that? But 20% to me is more than enough, um, you know, to be mm -hmm. socking away from each deal. And Mitch, one other thing you could do is like, I, I did this with my accountant. They should have like some sort of a spreadsheet to calculate your estimated tax based on, you know, you might have like a great quarter and then based on that, it could be adjusted. You could just ask right. your accountant for that. Just, just for reference, I do 30% because I live in Canada and then I'm moving to California. So I just do 30% just to be safe. And this he is like 50%. First, like, just kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> And this is like the really the first year I'm like fully 100% committed to it. So I would, I just yeah. personally, me being conservative, I'm like overestimating, but you could always have your accountant review and just give you, hey, this is based on the numbers, based on the money you made, this is how much you should be estimating. Okay. Yeah. And if anybody else is a wholesaler in here and wants to post what they do, um, I appreciate the feedback, but that gives me a good start. You know, I can. Yeah. It's better to throw too much in there than too little is kind of my yes. thought. Because at the end of the year, you know, if I have some extra left over, I just move it to my to my comp count. So yep. I appreciate it, man. Thank you a lot. Awesome. Now I was gonna say one other thing I personally noticed by being, you know, um conservative with my tax account that I had less money available for OPEX that kind of forced me to be more efficient with my running my business. So that's another personally the benefit that I noticed, you know, between my house flipping business recently and I own a management company, just, you know, I, I noticed like if I'm being more, if I'm putting more money aside for profit, compensation and taxes, then I have less money uh, available for OPEX. And it just, it gets me a little bit more creative on how we can increase our ROI on the same, yeah. you know, on less money now and still be able to make, you know, higher revenue. hundred percent. That's the added benefit of profit first. It's, it's that I think, um, Mike talks about in the original book. Oh shoot, it's that principle. Uh per not Pareto's, that's the 8021. But it's the other one where yeah, it's, it's like, like where you have Yeah, no. Uh, no, no. You know what I'm talking about. Or something, yeah. Oh right. right. Yeah, where, I forgot what it's called. But yeah, I know what you're the one where about. the work expands to fill the time that you give. So if you give a project three right. weeks, it'll take three weeks. If you give it three days, you'll take three days to do it. Same with your money. If you have a lot of money in there, you're gonna find a way to spend it. If you pare it down and like say, no, this is my profit and stuff, like then you have less to work with on the OPEX side. It's just, it's a principle, you know, like it's a, it's a rule there that that just happens and work time, money, business, everything. So now that was good. Another big question I get with people too. And I just want to address this is if you have multiple entities. So like you, you said, I've got wholesaling and rentals with Joey. We sent up, uh, we set up the a foundational accounts for the wholesale for his fix and fit for the rental company. But that's because he has them as two separate companies. They're two separate entities. He's doing business in both, like trying to get his rental portfolio up and you know and bigger. And then he's doing the flips as well. The only time I'm, when you I'm wouldn't set it there. up for a different, yeah, there you go. When you get that, and that's where you could set it up at any time. And especially if you use Relay, they give you twenty accounts for free. You know, like they're a free online system. If you want more than that, there they'll do a thirty dollar, a thirty dollars a month for as many accounts or like. 50 to 100 accounts or something, but then it's also unlimited wire fees too. Like it's crazy. Like they're going all in on profit first and for the real estate investing side. But that's where you could set up these accounts, have them there. Could you run them through with the rental side? Makes it really easy. That's why I like Relay. They're trying to make profit first as easy as possible on the banking side. So that's why I recommend them a lot now that I've used them for a while. But that's where if you have multiple entities doing multiple different functions, I would set up the core accounts for those different functions. But if you've got an rentals and sub LLCs and stuff. You don't need the accounts for each, you know, LLC that you have with those, you know, few rental properties or whatever. So that's a question I get a lot too. Ricky has two quick questions. Hey, um, I'm, I don't know if you can hear me too well. I'm on uh, mobile data. Do you hear yep. me? Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm, I've been doing profit first for about a, a year and a half now when we, we have relay. Um, I think we have about 26 checking counts total which is sounds ridiculous but honestly it's given us a lot of clarity so we do wholesale fix and flip and rental but like right now i have seven rentals and one thing i just haven't figured out the right way is 
with that um, diagram you showed earlier, you have the uh, like fix and flip and wholesale revenue. And then below that, you also have rental revenue with the whole taps and all that. Um, yeah. How would you go about, would, would you recommend two salary compensations, one from the wholesale fix and flip and one from the um, rental projection of it or? Huh, that's a really good could, question. I yeah, like that. I, see, I like that question. Um, I'm trying to think how, because the way I always used to do it was, okay, if, if someone has a rental and the net cash flow is X after vacancy and all that, that's what I would just send to my distribution, uh, my um, Ricky Miller distribution for my personal account. But with the whole profit first, we, I just, I've never, I kind of slowed down on sending money from the rental side. So thankfully, you know, we're saving up money. Cool. But we, I stopped sending money because I really am just trying to figure out the best um, system for that, I guess, how to yeah. do that portion. So any so, feedback on that, I guess? Yeah. So that's where, like, if you work with us, we go into customized profit first setups okay. for exact situations mm -hmm. like this, where it's like, do you need the money? Here's okay. Joey's such a great example for a lot of things. I promise we work with other people besides Joey, but like Joey's just a great example because he's got the multiple businesses. He was stealing from one business at the beginning, you know, to fund it. But so what I asked him up front was, what do you want from these businesses? And he's like, I want them to stand on their own. So that's like with this, you might want, uh, he would set up his owner's comp just from his fix and flip account. But like on the other side, he kept a small owner's comp there to make sure if he wanted someone to take over the rental management or CEO of that company or that arm that he started to build that in. So it's like for him, he knew one day he might want to get big enough to be able to do that. So it's like he wasn't necessarily drawing it, but it was a good way to get into that habit. So that way on that side, he could still pour money into the rental portfolio, but a small portion was going towards more of like a future compensation you know, bucket or a nice little buffer if something were to happen on the other side. So that's what he wanted. But for you, it might be like, do you want both funding you right now? Because in the future, might, you know, maybe you might step out of one or the other. This is more of where we get into what's your specific situation and what do you want to accomplish with these accounts? If you're like, well, no, I would want to pay myself just from the profit first, um, the owner's comp account from my fix and flip side and not take any money over there and just pay down my debt. Or no, I don't want to pay down debt. I want to buy more properties. It's like, then we just substitute that account. As long as you're paying yourself what you need and that's not a stress in your life, I don't care which one it comes from, but you're getting into that. Make sure you still set up like a profit account or something for the other companies. So that way you're just not spending every dollar that's coming in. So that's like, I would just that's give yourself that buffer. Hopefully that helps. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I think that um, brings more clarity on it. And then thank you, by the okay, way, David. Good. And then uh, yeah. one other question have you had do you have experience where um so like we have the opex for our uh, for us like wholesaling and flipping is kind of the same s sure. system it's just you know revenue wise so is there a decision that someone can make where let's say if um our op opex has let's say 60 odd thousand and we come across a fix and flip opportunity should we use the OPEX account to pay the, um, you know, hard money takes care of the first lien position, but we still got to come to closing with money, maybe like 27,000. Should we use the money out of the OPEX or should we maybe make a whole nother bucket of money if we don't raise a second lien position like private money? And I, I guess I've been trying to figure that out. If, if we wanted to take something down without raising a second lien, should we just like use our OPEX account? Or there's two answers to that. Number one, if it, the short answer for me would be yes, set up a separate account that's like property investments, like our own, you know, like whatever your company name is, you know, property funds. So that way it's like, okay, these are the funds specifically if we need to bring money to closing. So that way you're not touching your OPEX. Your OPEX is literally to run the business. Those are to like help fund those deals you might need to, you know, like supplement at closing or like throughout the lifetime of that deal. Or you could go, you know, and say, oh, I'm trying to think of the second part of that answer because that's because that's one way to do it. The other way is for this specific situation would be to go out there and make sure that you are getting the deals under contract and then saying, OK, how? OK, this is what I want to get to. It gives you clarity. What you're trying to get to is clarity of what do we really need to run the business and how much do we usually come up with to be able to fund 
these types of deals and how much do we do that on a regular basis? And if I were to take it from OPEX, would I still be okay? Because now having this system, I know how much goes out on a consistent basis for like my fixed expenses. And I know the variable expenses, even with those, how much it typically on a monthly basis is going out the door. So it's like making sure if you have those numbers, it gives you more clarity to know if I do take money out of OPEX, like on this next deal, I need to fund OPEX back to at least this amount. So that way I'm funding the business. So that way it's not just, you know, um, <clears throat> floating out there without any plan. Yeah, because uh, um, as you can imagine, if, if someone takes a flip down a day, they won't get that capital back for at least maybe three months or so. Exactly. So it probably even makes sense to make sure whatever your burn rate is on your operating spends that you have enough six, seven months, nine months of you know leeway in the event that you exactly. need to. Exactly. I got it. This is okay. why people get into the cash crunch in the fix and flip world because they're like, I love the deal. I've got the money. Let's do it. Oh, shoot. I'm not going to see that money for three to nine to 12 months. And like, you know, like, did I just shoot myself in the foot by yeah. going after that deal and spending my money? So it's but they don't know. They don't have that clarity to so one big account. It's like I have the money today. Hopefully I still have enough money to fund everything else. So, yeah, because I think that one on ahead. Yeah, on a, I guess on a tangent of that, we, we're um, looking at maybe just getting a line of credit to fund yeah. Um, yeah. just the taking deals down because then it would just be yeah. i feel like maybe easier and you know interest it's it's higher now but we wouldn't be paying points and all that um okay well sweet i thank you david i truly appreciate yeah. it yeah yeah for sure brady hi how david how are you hey brady good good to see you again yeah good to see you quick question about relay i use relay and i'm wondering how you deal with the lack of ability to um print paper check checks on at least relay 2.0 accounts currently and do you have any insight on when they're going to have that ability well we use ramp as a lot of the it's a free system that's kind of like bill.com only a lot easier and cheaper than bill.com to do checks it's an expense management software like that's what it's built for so okay. uh, there's a bad echo sorry so i don't know if that's you brady but that's where i want to make sure that if you have something like that ramp should really be or ramp not ramp relay should really be the banking function of it like here's the money comes in here's how we manage the cash where a ramp or a bill.com or some of these you know divi there's a, different expense management softwares that are literally for the expense management of that business quickbooks has a functionality like this but some of these other ones were built specifically for it like quickbooks online has just tried to copy a lot of what these other things are doing and they don't do it nearly as well so that's where we use like with a lot of the clients that we're working with ramp or other things like that to do the expense management side like checks that need to go to a vendor or something where it's a it's a contractor who can only accept a paper check you know versus an online ach payment or something they'll you can actually put that in and if there's approval process it'll send it out and then get it to them and that also helps you get an actual system in place versus i gotta write a check you know like okay they just asked for the money well no if you get it in by Wednesday, we'll approve by Friday. It'll be in your account then or whatever you do for your payment processing system. But that's how we get around it is that we use Relay just for the banking functionality and then use like an expense management software. Okay, great. Yeah. Part of my problem is I have some subcontractors that like they want paid on Friday, you know, with a physical check, uh, not checks in the mail, checks in the mail, sure. not ACH, you know. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I'd also say too, like, don't let contractors dictate your work. I know unless they're really good and like you can't afford not to have them, then you might need to bend over backwards and have an ex expense account. That's a contractor account with the bank that might let you do like the paper checks and just do it that way if you're want not wanting to get rid of them. But if they're always a pain in your butt and these are the same contractors that don't show up to jobs sometimes, it's like, eh. no, I'm s setting the process for you to follow instead of them yanking you around. So there's also that as well, too. Just want to throw that out there. Yeah, we, we also use, uh, I, I use a couple of different banks. I use Novo for our for my project management to pay the bills out of. So I take money from my operating, like Chase account, move it to Novo, and then she's paying. And then once we've gotten our contractors, you know, to what David was saying, just gotten them used to our process. Hey, this is how we're going to pay you. It, it's never been an issue. I mean, you know, some of, some of the guys will pay through PayPal, then they'll come up with other ways. But then we say, hey, these are the options that we have if you want to be paid. You submit your whatever is due by this date and we'll send a check out and you'll get it. But 
it's it's just about like getting them into a rhythm of paying consistently, not so much on, hey, I need to get paid today. Once you do that, it's not been a problem for us. Right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, cool. cool. Any any other questions, guys? I know we, David, thank you so much for going a few extra minutes. Uh, any yeah. other questions for anyone? Cool. Uh, so David, what we'll do is uh, once the recording is, so it's streaming live on our Facebook group, and then what we do is we'll, send the recording uh we'll put it on youtube also and uh and then if you want to send over your information we'll put it on the youtube video description and then we'll email it out to our email list and include your contact information so then you know uh, they can okay. contact you from there okay sounds good we'll make sure cool. to get that over absolutely man thank you so much for being on the call man i i really appreciate it i mean this is this is not this this is you know, awesome. sexiest topic in the world to talk about but i feel like to me personally it's like one of the absolute essential things that you have to do in your business. Otherwise, you don't really have a business. You kind of have a hobby, you know? And I also want to mention one thing, like to what you were saying, you know, people say, I hate fix and flip business. It's not, they don't necessarily hate the business. They hate the no. part that, you know, it's just getting overwhelming. Like they, they don't know where their money is growing. So it's, exactly. it's not the, it's not the fix and flip business that they hate. It's just, you know, they, they're not, they don't have the systems and processes to manage the cash. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. 100%. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you for the yeah. feedback. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. Of your Thank you, day. guys. Thanks, Bye. everyone, for being on the call. Thank you. Bye-bye.